memory of rainy afternoons, swingy Harlem tunes, motor trips and burning lips and burning toast and prunes. How lovely is love. For the memory of candlelight and blessings and the first time you're going to be in your day to work. This is the last night. And moments on the Hudson River line. How lovely it was. Many is the time that we feasted. And many is the time that we fasted. Which might Well, it was swell. <laughs> Good morning. Can you hear me okay? I'm Michelle Saunders, yes. and I'm the director of the Southwest and Central Geriatric Education Center of Texas, otherwise known as the South Texas Geriatric Education Center, since we've been around since 1985. So we're welcoming all of you today, also on behalf of the VA and whose lovely, as Mark calls it, auditorium, being the Audio Murphy VA, um, we're having this entire week. I, I did want to mention that for a little while this morning, you're going to be hearing bizarre sounds. The bizarre sounds are because we are streaming loud, uh, live to 15 different sites. And we're waiting for the gentleman to show up to turn off all the microphones in the 15 sites. So hopefully that will happen very soon and you won't get much crackle popping or listening to people's conversations. So hopefully that will be taken care of very soon. Meanwhile, um, for those of you who are not from the VA, if you go out the door that you came in, behind the room, the auditorium, uh, are the women and men's rooms. So uh, that's the important stuff. And the really important stuff, um, after I thank everybody, I'm, uh, is going to be given to you quickly by Joe Zapata, who is our coordinator for all these conferences, otherwise known as the Social Science Research Senior Person. And Mark Johnson, who is our IT guy. Barbara Giles in the back sitting at the table and um, also volunteering today for us is uh, Marie Brindle. And um, we're very grateful for everybody's help and their attendance. So thank you. People will come and go throughout the day as they have patient requirements. So just try to be courteous to your neighbor as you come and go. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Thanks. All right. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good Thank you so much for uh, showing up today. And for those who are in VTEL land, uh, please try your best to uh, attempt to mute the mics if you know how. If some in the next room who's a technician can do that for us, that would be greatly appreciated. And to hold all questions until um, the speaker has uh, uh, finalized uh, their talk. I'm going to be talking about CEUs real quick and some of the forms that you've uh, received uh, when you walked in. Uh, one of the smaller forms, which can also be uh, seen on the uh, PowerPoint, is the uh, the list of continued patient credits that we're providing and the amounts that we'll be receiving. Uh, you'll see uh, how many hours are given uh, daily and how many hours you can get maximum for the entire week and who is providing these individual uh, continued education credits. Uh, another thing is that uh, Mark Johnson is recording this and you can uh, order uh, this uh, DVD uh, by filling out the form, just look it in the back. Uh, you probably got a copy of that also. So if you want a copy of that all week, definitely go and fill that out and give it back to us. If you are non-VA and you are seeking CEs other than LPC and social work, raise your hand. Awesome, okay. So you'll be uh, filling out this form each and every day uh, you arrive and uh, to give it back to us at the end of the conference. Oh, thanks for the reminder. Cell phones. <laughs> Meet. Thank you. And uh, this is the non-VA participation instructions on how to obtain your, uh, uh, your, uh, your v if you're a non-VA, how to get your VA credits. And I'll be here all day if you have any questions about getting your CEUs. Um, I'll be more than happy to answer those uh, very difficult and sometimes confusing questions for you. And uh, lastly, uh, the last form is the participant profile form. This is a uh, demographic profile form. It's front and back. 
Um, if you've ever filled out this form before, ever, uh, you don't have to fill it out again. This is only a once in a lifetime kind of thing. Unless there's a major change in your employment at you know, any kind of uh, vital statistic, then yeah, you want to kind of update it for us. But what this does for us is uh, allows us to, uh, to obtain grant funding to provide for you this uh, low cost continuing education program. And of course, if you're part of the VA, it's a uh, free program for you. So, uh, does anybody have any questions right at the top for uh, continuing education credits? Any questions? Oh, awesome. All right. So, with that, our first speaker is Judy Funk. She is part of the South Texas uh, Alzheimer's Association branch of, uh, she's serving South Texas and San Antonio. Uh, we've, uh, we've been with, uh, partners with her uh, for several years and she's a uh, tremendous speaker and a tremendous asset to, uh, to educating uh, individuals about Alzheimer's disease and related dementia. So please give her a, uh, a welcome applause. Alzheimer's Association. I know they're snickering at me right now because they know that I'm not exactly a morning person. However, I am extremely grateful to be here with you all this morning to be able to work together with everyone at the Geriatric Education Center. Every program that they put on is just, it's incredible for, for all of you to be able to receive CEUs, but also just all the education and the updates. Um, again, my name is Jenny Funk and I work at the Alzheimer's Association. I have been there now for 14 years, and unfortunately, I am, oh, well, I guess this could go both ways, I am, I think, a better employee than ever because I'm now on this walk with my mom. So um, I have just learned so much about trying to help educate and help families and help professional caregivers, and then trying to apply that to life at home, how, how difficult it can be. But I also wholeheartedly want you to know that if you, if you are not aware of the Alzheimer's Association as a place to get help for either you as a professional or you as a family caregiver, I can't stress enough. I'm pretty sure I'm using almost all of the programs and services that our nonprofit organization offers, even though I work there. And it, it helps me. I think it's literally helping me every day to, to be a better uh, person, to help my mom, and to, to be able to help others. So um, I, did bring, I, I didn't bring a lot from our office. Our office is literally across the street at 7400 Louis Pasteur, upstairs in Suite 200. And we're loaded with brochures and handouts on pretty much any topic that that can come up related to, to Alzheimer's disease. The only brochure that I brought this morning was our basics. I highly recommend reading it from front to back. We, they sort of, our national office has, has stuffed a little bit of everything all into it, a little bit of the descriptions of the, the most prevalent kinds of dementia, not just Alzheimer's disease, um, some facts and figures, how to get help, what, it, what the disease is, um, updates on research. And, this year, I, I have been so fortunate to be able to, to talk at, at this particular conference before, and we will generally go over some basics of Alzheimer's, but I thought maybe this time we'd go through research. And before everyone's eyes just glaze over when you hear research, I think the, the most important part of this is that when I go through and when you hear about the facts about Alzheimer's disease, it's depressing. I mean, it can just absolutely flatten you with how devastating this disease is. But there is hope, and there's a lot of hope, and sometimes when we sort of, well, I'll just speak for myself, when you get kind of in this bubble of work and life and everything, it's, it's just, you don't even think about what's going on outside of our world. And then the world of Alzheimer's research, it's, there, it's amazing the things that are happening. So for that, I'm really glad to be able to show you what is happening outside of 
San Antonio and the state of Texas and, and around the world and the amount of people who are truly dedicated to doing as much as they can to try to find a cure for Alzheimer's disease because we, we need it so badly. So just, just a couple of basics about Alzheimer's disease. It's, it is progressive and I, I asked, I did a class on Saturday morning and one of the family members said, well, what do you mean what's progressive? And then another family said, well, it just gets worse and worse. Well, that is true. That's what progressive means. Um, and we don't have anything yet in science that will stop it from progressing. There are medications, and I know you're going to hear more about Alzheimer's and dementia at this conference, but um, as far as the medications that are FDA approved, they're approved to treat symptoms of Alzheimer's and dementia, but not the actual progression of the disease itself. There are, let's say, we, we, so we don't actually call those treatments. So with Alzheimer's disease, over 5 million Americans have Alzheimer's, and the updated statistic now is 47 million people worldwide have Alzheimer's disease. And it is the sixth leading cause of death in America. And if you're over the age of 65, for everyone in that category, it's the fifth leading cause of death in America. And if I held up the, the top 10 killers with Alzheimer's, right it, overall sixth, it's the only one on that, the only disease on that list, or the only cause of death on that list that doesn't have a way to treat it, to prevent it, to cure it. And that is absolutely just unacceptable. So. Um, again, one, like other diseases, and I'll, I'll give you some comparisons about death rates and how death rates for other diseases have declined, well, that's absolutely worth celebrating and cheering. I mean, that, that's fantastic. That does come directly from the research and the clinical studies that are done to be able to help, help treat those diseases. Okay, so... So, just kind of already went through this. Um, so right now we're about one in nine people over the age of 65 have Alzheimer's disease. That's currently. Uh, one in three over 85. That's a lot. And that then equates to, this, these are just American numbers, more than 15 million people are providing care. So I just think this, this chart is pretty incredible. So when you look at over a 10 year span, from the year 2000 to 2010, the death rates for breast cancer, prostate cancer, heart disease, stroke, and look at the incredible death rate decline for the individuals with HIV and AIDS, it's 42% on the decline, death rates. And then you look at over that same 10 year span, Alzheimer's disease death rates have shot up 68%. Ooh, I don't know what that beat meant. Just keep, keep going. going. <laughs> okay. Um, so here, here, this also directly relates to this. So the amount of funding, because to do any kind of research, it takes moolah, and it takes a whole bunch of it. So when you look at the amount of money that is designated for these different diseases. Cancer is currently at $5.4 billion with a B. That's how much research is funded for cancer. For heart disease, it's $1.2 billion. For HIV and AIDS, it's $2.9 billion. And for Alzheimer's disease, we, we actually just are right at about $600 million. We, I can't even tell you, for the entire time I've been with the association, we've been advocating for $1 billion, $1 billion. We're still at about $600 million. And that, again, we are to absolutely celebrate what's happening with those other diseases, and there is absolutely a direct link between the amount that goes into research and the effect of what that has on people with the, with the disease. So, oh gosh, I'm trying to think of um, years-wise. It's been a couple of years now. For years and years and years, we didn't have a national plan to address Alzheimer's disease. 
We have for cancer for quite some time. We do for HIV and AIDS, etc. So through a whole bunch of major advocacy, we now do have a national plan to, to address Alzheimer's disease. And in that, that became an act that was signed into law. And right at the very, I guess the top goal of it was to come up with ways to prevent and treat Alzheimer's by 2025. Well, if you think about how fast time flies, how, how are we, what month are we in? We're in June. How is that even, how is it possible? That just, it just seems like time flies so incredibly fast. So 10 years from now, this plan is, is supposed to come up with this. And this is a, a major goal. And through that to increase clinical studies enrollment. So I, I most definitely want to share with you here in a little bit about how do you even, how do you find out about research studies? Because sometimes when I think about research, I think, oh, it's off in Sweden somewhere. What in the world, you know, how's, what are we going to do with that? Well, there are actually even uh, doctors, researchers here in San Antonio who are funded through the Alzheimer's Association and through the government to do research studies on Alzheimer's. So it is local and statewide and worldwide. But how do you find out about them? So we have this program called Trial Match where you can actually put your information in and find out if just based on your just basic information uh, whether you might qualify for a clinical trial. Expand the scale and scope of research. There are, that's another thing. Some people, when you hear research, I just automatically think of, okay, it's drugs. It's about medications. But it's not. There are so many different kinds of research studies. Quality of life. We can absolutely use more studies on how do we improve the quality of life for someone who on average can live with Alzheimer's disease for 8 to 10 years. We had a board member who lost her mom who had it for 16 years, 16 years of life. We do know of others that have reached the 20 year mark. That's a long time. So quality of life studies can make a big difference. So it's not just about um, drugs, but then I go right into the next bullet. To accelerate drug research because, let's see, the last FDA approved <coughs> medication for Alzheimer's was approved in, I hope I get this right, I'm pretty sure 2006. That was a long time ago. So this is also about how can we get these through the pipeline faster to where they are then out and available to the public. All right, so um, last, let's see, on December 11th of 2011, the first, you've heard of G8 summits, well the first G8 summit on dementia was held. That was a huge, huge big deal. Um, the gentleman sitting at the table on the far left, that is our national CEO, executive director, and he was there to present, to talk about um, all kinds of information. London hosted this Air National Summit, and people came together, um, experts, researchers, anyone who was really um, tied closely to the disease to talk about how this not only affects America, but worldwide, and how we can work together on research studies so that it's not in, I guess we kind of call it silos, so that you don't have your research over here and it's kept private and separate from another group that's doing their research. We need everyone to work together. So to bring leaders together was um, very, very important. And it, were, it did mark the first sort of collaborative effort by governments from other countries to make research a global priority. That was most definitely a first. Okay, so, oh gosh, so there's so much on this one. Um, a couple of things. The association is heavily involved in helping families, again, on a day-to-day -day basis with whatever is, whatever is happening with their loved one and with really trying to take care of caregivers as much as possible. The other end of what we do is we raise money to fund research, but again, we need a way to kind of bring that all together. So all of these things I would say are 
new just within the last maybe 10 years. And Alzheimer's disease has been around for over 100 years. It was Dr. Aloise Alzheimer who, when you are so smart that you discover something, they name it after you. Well, someday I would like to be Dr. Funk, and I would like to discover something and have it named after me, not a, not a terrible brain disease. But So Dr. Alzheimer discovered this brain disease, and they named it after him. And that's how we ended up with Alzheimer's, a word that you know, can be difficult to spell, difficult to say. But it was named after the doctor. That was 100 years ago. So fast forward till now, we definitely know more about Alzheimer's in the last 20 years than in that whole time it's been around. And all of these groups have been brought together, research roundtable, where there are different companies, different pharmaceutical companies that will come together and meet quarterly with representatives from the association and talk about things that they are discovering. There are different, um, I start, I start on the far right, that is a I guess it's kind of like a membership club for individuals who want to, um, students and professionals who want to be more involved in research and um, information about research and clinical studies that are coming out. There, um, okay, there's Trial Match right down here on the far left. So Trial Match is, you can just literally go to alz.org slash trial match or you can call our 800 number, which is 24 hours a day, and ask for trial match information. And literally every research study is, is basically entered into a website that, our, that the government, they kind of have the, oh, what do you want to call it, the, the holding pot for information about all the different research studies that are happening at a .gov website. Well, trial match has all of that information. And when you enter your basic information into this online, it's basically like a, an application almost, it will give you information on, okay, are there any clinical studies in this area that you initially may be qualified for? And it's not just for people who have Alzheimer's disease. It's not just for their family members. It's also for what they call well volunteers. So I will make an assumption that everyone in the room, that we are all well volunteers. They also, they wholeheartedly want to um, look at research on why do family, why are there families who have a history of Alzheimer's and the next generation do not get it? Or why in a family of seven do four individuals end up with Alzheimer's disease and three don't? I mean, they want information on, on everything. And right now, what we're told is the two reasons why we don't have a cure yet is one, there's not enough money to fund all the scientists who have research studies, but the other is that, that thing about there aren't enough human beings enrolled in clinical trials. And it's difficult, particularly with this disease, when you're talking about research and getting someone enrolled, sometimes with this disease, it's it's hard to it's hard to understand. Okay, how am I going to basically enroll my loved one when I may not be able to ask for their Do they want to do this? Is this something they want to participate in? So that can make it difficult, which is a whole other topic about why it's so important to have discussions with people when they're in the early stages of Alzheimer's, so you can find out. Is there ever a time that you may want to participate in future studies on this? Those kind of things. So we have a whole, not just the website, but we have a whole set of information about the myths about research. You know, some people don't want to have anything to do with research because they think that they'll have to go off every medication that they're currently on. Not necessarily so. There's quite a few where you keep, you keep on with what you're on. And it's, it can be a benefit, the, the different things that are involved. So we have information on all those type things. Um, so just thinking about the association, we're the connector, convener, and the funder of research, which again, ultimately, we, we need to find a cure for, for Alzheimer's and all the different kinds of dementia. So just some statistics up to this point. Um, 
We've added on to up to 335 million to 2,250 scientists who have done investigations since 1982. Right about the early 80s was when studies were just finally started and coming together. Right now, there are at least 350 ongoing research projects in 20 different countries. There are a community of 6,000 active peer review scientists from over 60 countries. So absolutely, we need, the, we need people at the leadership level to be able to decide, okay, out of all those, basically their applications for research studies, which ones are we going to fund? Um, funding across critical research, finding out needs and gaps. And interestingly enough, we're ranked third. So we used to say the only, the Alzheimer's Association funds the most research other than our federal government. Well now, actually, China. China and their government rank number two in the amount of money that they're spending towards Alzheimer's research. Um, for the first time, I would say, oh gosh, it's been a couple of years now, finally we have an Alzheimer's and Dementia journal and it's been um, very helpful to be able to look at different research studies, outcomes, basically have a journal of our own to be able to print about different clinical studies. There is a way to get the journal on the website and we get um, 32,000 hits Wait, is that right? Yes. Um, um, per month onto the website. I know that there's, I don't know exactly what it is because our office, we, we do get a copy of it, but I know that there's a, a short fee for it, but for, um, for individuals who are very interested in, in that getting really down deep into what the actual clinical studies are doing, all of that can be found in this um, print journal. So the last, uh, last year, in 2014, every year, an international conference on Alzheimer's is convened. And last year it was in Denmark. Um, no, I was not on the plane or the list of people to get to go. But it's incredible. More than 4,000 researchers all came together to share their information. And we did have individuals that traveled from San Antonio to be able to show and share information about different research studies that they were doing back home. So that's the international conference. Um, in 2015, it's going to be in Washington, D.C. next month. So at that, there were over 4,000 attendees. Scientists came from 7,500 com countries. Again, this is it's so hopeful when we look at the future of Alzheimer's disease and what we are currently facing with um, 77 million baby boomers who as of two years ago started turning 65 years of age. And when you hit 65, that's when your risk for developing Alzheimer's shoots up highly. So when we're looking at the future of all those individuals and all the people who currently have it, it's helpful to know how many people truly are invested in this and want to do as much as they possibly can. Um, so there were more than 2,000 abstract presentations that happened. The other thing that comes out of AAIC, and watch for this ne next month in July, it raises a ton of news about Alzheimer's. And we need that. We need that so much. Think about a time when Breast cancer was a no-no topic. We didn't, we didn't really talk about cancer for, I mean, there, cancer was a no-no topic, but then you add on to that, talking about breast cancer. But now, fast forward, look at where we are now. It's incredible, the amount of awareness about what pink represents, the amount of, thankfully, death rates being on the decline. Slowly, but they are on the decline. We need the same thing to happen with Alzheimer's disease. So when these type of um, big meetings like this happen, you'll see it all over. You'll see it in the news and journal and magazines. And it's so helpful because we need that awareness. And also, stigma. 
stigma is just something that we absolutely need to do whatever we can to get rid of it. To just get rid of it. And so these types of things also help to do that. Oh boy. Okay, so um, from through research there has also been um, updates in definitions and the way that the actual um, diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease is done um, as far as doing studies on mild cognitive impairment and updating the definition in the in the what is it DSM I'm going to get it wrong but um, all of those types of things have also been updated because getting a diagnosis is very, it can be very difficult. It can be difficult for someone in their middle 70s or 80s. Think about someone in their mid 40s or 50s. Sometimes it can take up to five years to get a diagnosis because we still, this disease is still not one that you can walk into your doctor's office and go, all right, give me the, you know, give me the blood test or, or give me the, um, you know, some sort of test and then be able to walk out with, yep, it's Alzheimer's. It's so, it's just so much more than that. There's so much part of the assessment process. So we most definitely continue to need for research to find a way where we can have more of a definitive diagnosis. One of the facts and figures that came out, um, the association puts out every year a, a facts and figures, I'll say booklet, but it's actually more like a book. It's a giant thing. And all those numbers have to be basically vetted through the Centers for Disease Control and et cetera, et cetera. It, it has to be all basically real before it can be put in print. But one of the most alarming statistics that came out this year is that less than half of the people who have Alzheimer's disease are told their diagnosis, including their caregivers. So compare that to more than 90% of people who have cancer are told about their diagnosis and, their, and anyone else who's there. Because if, if we're not even going to acknowledge that it's a problem or that, it's there, that it truly is happening, how do you go from there? So that is huge in our future as well. Being able to, to get a diagnosis, to talk about it, to talk about the pers with the person about it, and at the very least, ca family caregivers, so that we can address it. Yes, we know there's no cure, we know there's no prevention, but at the very top of our list, I will say there's a prevention. Learn as much as you can about the disease, what it does to the brain, why someone then behaves the way they do, and how, as the person without dementia, you can react and take care of that person. It makes a huge difference. That in itself is a treatment. So, okay, so let me keep going. Um, oh, well, I sort of skipped forward, but that's Dr. Alzheimer right there in the bottom left. That is the woman who he discovered way back over a hundred years ago having plaques and tangles on her on a brain slide. It's been around a very, very long time. Looking at the continuum, age, age is still considered the number one risk factor for anyone getting Alzheimer's disease. So I truly think one of our um, I hate to say slogans, but I, I think one of our taglines very soon is going to be, who's at risk for developing Alzheimer's? Anybody with a brain. Now, if that doesn't make you wake up and think about it, for sure, that's highly alarming. You don't have to have a history of Alzheimer's in your family to get Alzheimer's disease. If you do, you're at a higher risk, but it doesn't mean that you're going to get Alzheimer's disease. I think this is going to be covered later today, so I won't go too much into that, but true familial Alzheimer's disease, that is genetic-based. Did anyone see or hear of the movie Still Alice? Okay, a couple, a few. So Still Alice is the movie that um, it did raise a whole lot of awareness because Julianne Moore won a Golden Globe and an Oscar for it. In our world, what in the world does that mean? Who cares, right? 
but it was a huge, huge deal because it did, her portrayal of someone with Alzheimer's at 50 years old, it did reach a lot of people and it showed really very factually and kind of in your face what it's like to have Alzheimer's disease and at such a young age. It's more rare, but it does happen. And in her family, it was that very, very small percentage of what we call familial Alzheimer's disease. But again, if you, if you get, I see now it's on pay-per-view, you can rent it. If you get the opportunity to check it out, it really is, it's pretty incredible. But that, that was showing familial, which out of all the Alzheimer's disease that's out there, familial is less than 4%. So that's very, that's rare. It's a very small, small percentage. What, what this shows, and, and what, um, and I, I need to let a doctor kind of go into all of this, but there is um, thinking out there that it's possible that Alzheimer's disease is in the brain at a much earlier age. It's just that symptoms don't start to appear for most individuals until 65 and older. So taking a look at research studies of younger individuals. That's being done. Um, looking at what is a biomarker to be able to measure change. That's something that you hear about with other diseases and it's been difficult with Alzheimer's disease. A, a way to predict, to have a reliable predictor and indicator of a disease and how it's gonna progress. So for example, with diabetes, example, T-cell count for someone with HIV and AIDS, cholesterol for heart disease. Still working on that for Alzheimer's disease. Looking at, on a scale, normal, uh, preclinical, pre um, mild cognitive impairment, and then Alzheimer's disease, where Alzheimer's, maybe there were other things happening, again, long before actual full-blown Alzheimer's disease was happening in the brain, that all of this could possibly be what's leading up to that and studying so much more of the, the first three. Um, so ongoing research to be able to improve diagnostic accuracy uh, I will just share, I'm, I'm in this world. I've been in this world for a long time and I still, we still don't have a definitive diagnosis for my mom. Severe dementia. Okay. Um, I would, it would, it's just, it can be very hard to make a diagnosis. And it's estimated that half of the people who have, have Alzheimer's or a dementia have what's called mixed dementia. So they have more than one at the same time. So you can have Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease, or Lewy body and Alzheimer's disease. So mixed dementia. Um, so looking at as a potential biomarker, sometimes you'll hear about um, individuals that will go in for a spinal tap to be able to look at um, in clinical trials, what might be an effective drug going that route rather than the FDA approved medications that are on the market right now that target, ooh, is that, Joe, is that you? Are you scratching your beard or are you doing the shush? <laughs> I just want you guys to know that, my, that Joe said, this will be my sign when it's time for you to wrap it up. <laughs> and he's back there like this and I thought maybe that's what he meant. Anyway, sorry. Um, okay, so let me keep going. So pet imaging. Well, this is pretty incredible. This was certainly not around 20, 50 years ago where just think about being able to go in and do research on a live brain. That's why it used to be that in order to make an accurate diagnosis of Alzheimer's, they would say it had to be after someone passed away. And if you want to go through the process of having an autopsy done on the brain and then determine if there are plaques and tangles on the brain, well now it's estimated that with a, with a neurologist, a geriatrician, a doctor who specializes in this today, they can get up to a 98% accurate diagnosis. And part of that process is PET imaging of the brain. 
It's not considered the way to make a diagnosis, but it, it can be used in conjunction with all the other types of cognitive assessment and getting all the stories from the family of things that are, are really going on at home, um, that kind of thing. Ruling out any other types of problems that may be causing dementia symptoms. So may I ask something? Sure. So if we can do that, then why can't you walk out with a diagnosis if you have all these factors, you have this, what, why, is, why are they walking out without a diagnosis? Well, because some people have plaques and tangles, well, it's estimated that most people have plaques and tangles on their brain, but do not have any indication whatsoever of any of the symptoms of dementia or Alzheimer's. So I can't even sort of go even further than that because it, I, it's, it does get really confusing. Valerie, please. You know, I was just going to say that this particular imaging is extremely mm -hmm. expensive. Yes. And so everyone cannot afford this Good type point. of definitive, um, something that would help. Good point. We still are, and that's part of advocacy efforts that we are trying to advocate for when you go in to get these types of tests. These are very expensive and not and not available. So think about, I kind of think about AIDS, when AIDS was, when all of that was happening, there were, you know, at first things weren't available to mass population and um, so we're kind of in that. It is. It is sad and it's not right. It's not okay. So, um, Okay, so on this, this is tau imaging and going from what it looks like on the brain of a healthy individual, uh, mild cognitive impairment, mild Alzheimer's, and severe Alzheimer's. Again, same thing, very expensive, can be, should be used in conjunction with a lot of other parts of an assessment, not just the one that you would, would walk out with. So prevention. We don't have a way yet, we can't, we, we don't even use the P word. There's no way for anybody to prevent getting Alzheimer's. You can be the smartest, healthiest person in the world. You can be the President of the United States and get Alzheimer's disease. I mean, it, it can be re regardless of politics, any of that kind of stuff. You can be anybody and get it. But one thing that we do know is that much earlier in life, there, there are things that we can do to, um, to lower your risk. So for example, now we know that traumatic brain injury can lead to individuals having a much higher prevalence later in life of having Alzheimer's disease. So June is Alzheimer's and Brain Awareness Month, and on that list, 10 ways to love your brain, wear a helmet. Sounds kind of simple, but if there's anything that you do have control of, which putting a helmet on, that, that certainly is, we don't have control over the fact that we're aging or what our family genetics are. We are stuck with, we are stuck with one of those. I think it's a blessing that we get to age. I have to tell this because I say this and every time I speak, I have such a hard time when I hear derogatory things said about seniors or old people because I just want to say, well, which direction are you going in? I mean, we're hope, hopefully, thankfully, we, we're all headed in that direction. So, um, anyway, so there are things that, that we do have control of. Uh, we now know that pretty much everything from the neck down does have an effect on the brain. So we know that diabetes is now, there's a link between health of the rest of the body, heart disease, diabetes, that can cause a higher risk of later developing Alzheimer's disease. So what's good for your heart is also good for your, good for your brain. Oh, hardly. Let me keep going. Um, these are some very specific uh, worldwide trials that are happening. I, there, I can't even, there's so much, um, oops. There's so much on these that um, I can't even exactly tell you. Um, there's the Alzheimer's Prevention Initiative, the Diane, sometimes you'll hear on the news about the Diane study, looking at those families that do have the dominantly inherited um, genes. So like Alice, and still Alice, when you are looking at um, family gen genetics being very much part of the 
um, situations. So they have families who, and, and when I talked about that less than 4% of all the people who have Alzheimer's, that's, that it's truly familial Alzheimer's, almost everyone in that category has had someone with younger onset Alzheimer's. So younger than 65. We call that younger onset. So if you have someone who's, geez, we had a gentleman who's 44 who walked into our office with Alzheimer's. And um, so his family would be one that, that they would want to take a look at because all those families with, with um, familial Alzheimer's have, we don't know why yet, but that's part of that study. Um, oh, oh. Okay, so the Diane trial, um, talking about familial Alzheimer's, looking at um, just being able to do studies. The association of, I guess you could say, the, the pot of money that the association um, uses for research studies through the National Institute of Health provided $4.2 million for that one, um, $6 million from NIH in the fall of 2013, and then another 5.5 million in 2014. And now, due to a whole bunch of advocacy, NIH will put 20.5 million over the next four years specifically towards that trial. Um, okay, so GAIN, the Global, what is it? Global Alzheimer's Association Interactive Network is a project that will allow researchers to, to have access to other studies, to other information, to other tools, and it's worldwide. So that, that's very, very exciting, very, very hopeful. So um, in summary, there is a continuum, and now they're looking so much more, oh, thanks, perfect. Thanks, Joe. Um, looking at, um, opening the door to be able to find a way to prevent, looking at individuals much at a, at younger in life. Um, significant advances having been made in research, uh, very, very, very significant. Um, the association global leader, so when you do see us around and we've got our programs and our classes, but we're always asking for support, our walk to end Alzheimer's coming up in the fall, um, the longest day, which the longest day of our year is summer solstice. That was literally yesterday. Not that you got any sign of it being summer yesterday. Whew. But it truly was. And on the longest day, that day of the year is recognized for caregivers because every day feels like the longest day. So when we're asking, these are the reasons why. Um, the two things, absolutely, that are key factors are advocacy, help be an advocate for, for, for everyone with Alzheimer's disease. If you are touched by it or you work with someone with it, please share your, share your stories. Not, not, not the confidential information, but what the disease is truly like so that anyone who's outside of this world can really start to understand. And then awareness. Awareness, we need it. We have to have it just like those other, di those other diseases. And then um, research is the path to ultimately achieving our vision of a world without Alzheimer's. That's our ultimate goal. So I'll leave you with this one. Whoops, get the right one. The end of Alzheimer's starts with you, with each of us individually. I have a, a couple of minutes left. Any, any questions or comments that I can take before I turn it over to the next? Yes, ma'am. I just had a question. You mentioned China as the second highest impact funder of research. Do you know who the first is? The, so our national government, of, of all the entities that fund research, the United States government leads with about 600 million that they designate towards Alzheimer's research funding. So we used to say we're the, the Alzheimer's Association is the largest private contributor of funding other than the federal government. But now we have to say, well, actually, we're third in line overall in the world for the amount that we raise and put towards research because China's in there too. Which is pretty, that's incredible. That's good. We, we need help from, from everywhere. 
she would ask, who's the number one funder? Our, our federal government. Okay, just quick reminder for everybody. Uh, I'll go ahead. Go ahead and ask a question. I have a question. Go for it. Okay. We can hear you. Go ahead and ask a question. Going once. I have a question from Kerville. Okay, Kerville, we can hear you. Yes, sir. Okay, there was a recent study that showed the being thin is more of a risk factor for Alzheimer's than being obese. Can you make a comment on that? I actually have abs have not heard that, have not seen that. Um, I, but I'm so glad that you asked the question because the first thing that I'll do, I'll go back to my office and I'll go to alz.org and I'll put that into the search bar and see if anything comes up. Because when things hit the news, Things like smelling tests, and you'll be able to find out if you have Alzheimer's. Or if you drink coconut milk, you won't get Alzheimer's. When things like that hit the press, of course, people, you know, we, we're, we, we want solutions wholeheartedly. It's the best place to find out what kind of study that was, how many people did they study, you know, was it, um, was it, was it 10 people or was it 10,000 people? All of that information, we go straight to our national organization where they have experts who can really, a lot of times they'll give us talking points. So it's possible that even by the time I get back to the office, if this was something new that has been um, put out, it will get talking points on, okay, this research study was done and this, this, and this. That doesn't mean this that, is go ahead, sorry. This was discussed in the Alzheimer's Forum, and this brought up the question of, you know, the role of the diabetes and all the lipids because obesity, you know, put, you know, predisposed to all these diseases. Maybe there's another reason that really causes the Alzheimer's. This was discussed in the Alzheimer's Forum. That's why I brought this up. Absolutely, absolutely. Thanks for your comments. I really will. I recommend that if you hear something or if you have questions, please call our 800 number. It's 1-800-272-3900 or go to our website. It's just alz.org and you can ask about it. I'm, I'm the program and advocacy director for our chapter, so I honestly, I know that you will have other doctors presenting later today. They'll be able to hopefully answer that better than I. Okay, we have one more question. Okay, and I'll, I'll stick around. I know you have someone right after me, but um, I'll, you know, I'll stick around if there's any, anything that you guys need from me. Yes, ma'am. Okay, if, if a loved one wanted to enroll um, a person with Alzheimer's into the study. Yes. And but they, the person with Alzheimer's was really it was advanced. Maybe they didn't have the mental capacity. Mm -hmm. Would the doctor defer to them for being next of kin, or would they need to have a medical power of attorney put in place for them to be able to make that choice? That's a really good question. Our role in that is to try to match people to the studies, but it's really each individual study, they would, they would be able to tell you whether, how that works as far as permission from the person, how much capacity do they have, do they not have, does it have to come from power of attorney, all those kind of things, it would really be dependent upon that, whatever particular study was being done. But that's a great question. But don't automatically assume that you couldn't if you didn't have power of attorney. I mean, the, I just, the main thing is, is they whole, I kind of make a joke, there's only so many mice. But it's, I mean, they really do, all research studies need more human beings to <coughs> participate. There is a shortage. So that's a great, great question though. It's up, up to each one. Okay. I'm getting the official beard scratch stop. A brainy <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, you. thank you all. Burning lips and burning toast and prose. How lovely it was. Thanks for the memory. 
of candlelight and wine, castles.